need to bring your attention to on the 23rd of July, I know it's a ways off, at, the next Hearts to Hands will be at our church. And it's going to be a picnic style. So this is just getting it in your heads right now, okay? It'll be, I think, on a Sunday. I think that's when it is. Um, for those of you who are interested in the men's retreat, that's in two weeks from this weekend. And then on that Sunday, the 19th, they're having a cleanup day at Mohaven. That will be the last um, Sunday that they'll be doing that. The relay for life has been canceled. It will be June 3rd, just due to the weather. The weather has not been very good. But it will be the same hours, noon to 9 p.m. at the uh, uh, what? West G High School track. Um, June 3rd. Uh, let's see. I don't know if any of you read your bulletin, but Imani was baptized last week at um, one of the churches in Berry and Springs. She's going to Andrews right now, so keep her in your prayers, because I'm sure this will be when Satan wants to dump on her. So, but keep her in your prayers, and she'll be done with school, I think she's done this week, and then she's going to Europe for her trip on this summer. She'll be fun. I wish I was going with her. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see here. Hearts to hands. I just talked about that one. There is a Ohio Conference one day camp meeting scheduled on the 3rd of June also. So it's going to be a heavy day. So you'll have to decide what you want to do. <laughs> so, and let me see what else. Does anybody have anything else that they would like to say? Okay, welcome, and may God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's rainy, but... Um, we can always find something even in a, even in a rainy day, day to be thankful for. And uh, there's something about the rainy day, and it can be memorable. That's a positive thing. Um, so, and uh, it's kind of nice in some ways. Yes. I wouldn't want it to be always like that. But anyway, welcome everyone to church, and good to see you. Now let us start our praise time with the um, first song, 286, Wonderful Words of Life. Oh, Chief of Sinners. Oh, it was, okay. Anyway, it was a little bit reversed, but uh, we're fine here. Okay, Chief of Sinners, which is 295 in our handbook. Wonderful words of life. Let's, oh, 286, yes. And uh, let's everyone stand up. <clears throat> Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words. 
study because I'm the one that picks up the songs. <laughs> what we're going to do is, hopefully, Joe, can we just do the first, second, and, and third stanzas? Can we do that? Are you have them all on there? Are all the verses on there? We'll do the whole thing. Thank you very much. All together, number 598. Watch ye saints with eyelid waking, lo, the power of heaven are shaking. Keep your lamps all trimmed and burning, ready for your Lord's returning. Lo, he comes, yes, Jesus comes. Lo, he comes, he comes all glorious. Jesus comes to reign victorious. Lo, he comes, yes, Jesus comes. Lo, the promise of your Savior, heart in sin and purchase favor, blood wash robe, haste to tell redemption story. Lo, he comes, yes, Jesus comes. Lo, he comes, he comes, the glorious Jesus comes. Lo, he comes, yes, Jesus comes. Kingdoms at their bases rumbling, mark the hurried wheels are crumbling. Tell, oh, tell of grace abounding. While the seventh trump is sounding, lo, he comes, yes, Jesus comes, lo, he comes to reign the glorious, Jesus comes to reign victorious, lo, he comes, yes, Jesus comes, nations, wait, wait. I thought you had them all, Joe. No, you have one, two, three? Oh, we're off to a great start there, folks. Good to see all of you. Please be seated. Good morning again. Let's turn in our scriptures to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Verses 5 and 6. Matthew 25, 5 and 6. But while the bridegroom delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you will be coming soon, and we ask today for your presence to be among us through the power of the Holy Spirit so that we may answer the call when you do come. Thank you now for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Uh-oh, somebody lost a smile. Is there one in there? Oh, okay. Well, maybe before we're done, I'll see that smile. How is everyone? Pretty good? Great. You know that God is our creator, right? And you know that we are his creation, right? Let me ask, who can tell me some of the things that God created? Anybody? Outside the mountains? Yes. Birds. Birds, yes. Um, uh, 
birds um uh, uh fly they can fly on the pond absolutely they can fly on it he created the pond and he also created all of you and me well you know not when we talk about things that are created what do you think that means do you ever create anything yeah like you're making something or something being built. And usually when we think about being creative, the first thing that comes to our mind is, I don't know, maybe music, like the Hallelujah Chorus by Handel. You know that? Hallelujah, Hallelujah. You've heard that, sure. Uh, or have you ever seen this picture of the Last Supper? Yeah, sure you have. Well, you know what? doesn't always mean music or art. Now, you might have a gift or a talent for being very organized, or maybe you're really super great at math. That's creative, too. Gifts and talents glorify God when we follow his leading in how to use them. Let me show you what I mean. This man is George Washington Carver. He was a scientist, and he was also a man of very deep faith. He once asked God, Lord, tell me the secrets of the universe. Well, instead of the universe, God pointed him to something much smaller, the peanut. Have you ever seen a peanut plant? You have? If you, oh, you think that's funny. There's your smile. Okay. <laughs> that's a peanut plant. That's the way they grow. Well, the secrets that George Washington Carver discovered led to the inventions of hundreds of new discoveries, including peanut butter and paint and oil and synthetic marble and plywood and even the dye used in Crayola crayons. Oh, don't we love those crayons and the colors that they have? Well, all of his conventions, inventions, you know what he said? Carver said humbly that all of them came from his creator. He often said, the Lord has guided me, and without my Savior, I am nothing. Isn't that something? He first reached out to the Lord, and the Lord blessed him in a way that enabled him to create all of these wonderful things. Now, what if we try and create maybe without the Lord's input? You might wind up something like the baby mama. Somebody really invented this. They, they put those mop things on the baby and let the baby crawl around on the floor, and maybe your floor gets clean and maybe not. Well, let's go back to someone else who asked the Lord's help. This man is Gary Starkweather, and he invented the laser printer. He credits the success of his inventions to the guidance and inspiration of God. He said God must be pleased when he sees us putting our tools and creativity to good use. Then there's the inventor of the anti-theft lunch bag. Can you see that? That's a fly in there and, and some black ink prints. Well, boys and girls, sometimes at work in the company refrigerator, someone will take your lunch and eat it. But not if you slip it into one of these sandwich bags. <laughs> You know what? Sometimes we can be afraid to use our talents for God, maybe fearing we're not good enough or people will make fun of us. But you take that step with his hand in yours. If you're willing, God gives us the courage and the inspiration to use our creativity and imagination for wondrous things. He asks that we live a life 
worthy of the calling that we have received. And you can do that no matter how young you are or how old you are. Can I have someone lead us in prayer? You want to? Okay. Come on, Ram. Lead us in prayer. Dear God, um, thank you for the beautiful day. Thank you for the children's story. Thank you for helping us be good listeners. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Wonderful. I'm glad to see that smile finally. All right. Well, folks, the children are going to come around, and they'd appreciate any donations you can give them. Your funds go through towards the children's ministries here at the church. Thank you. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. Uh, if the deacons would um, come forward.
us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all the blessings that you have given us. And uh, um, please bless the givers and please bless the gifts. Amen. just um, ask you to pray for um, this family. Diabetes is affected my eyesight really bad. So I'm going to begin some treatments as they describe it as taking that needle and sticking it into their eye the first of several treatments, and uh, they haven't been able to write me a new prescription for almost two years now, and they will not write it until some things get corrected. And meanwhile, with my glasses, I can barely see the screen back there like I used to to see the sun. So just pray for me if you find some time on Wednesday, just lift up my name and uh, that things will go well, because it is only the beginning not sure how many treatments there will be. Um, it just depends on how I react. So um, if you want to, as you lift up my name, if you want to add to it, please pray for Pastor because he is a chicken and scared. I'll, I'll add that with him. I'll, I'll be fine with that because I am really scared about this. But it has to be done. And I'm putting my faith in God and we'll do it through the Spirit. Uh, my appointment is Anita, I saw your hand. What's her first name? Elsa. Elsa? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Our Pathfinders made it down to the fair yesterday, okay, in all the rain. 
and they are able to stay in the cabins this year because tenting would have been a mud, a mud hole. So they got down there safe, and just keep them in your prayers that they have a good weekend. Jerry and uh, Mike and Cheryl and Patrick and Riley and Alyssa and Alex went. So and they're going to do honors today, and tomorrow they have marching and drilling. And they've been marching and drilling for uh, several months now, and they've gotten their routine down quite well. Last year they had first place. Let's see how they do this year. Any, anybody else? Unspoken? Okay. Where possible, let us kneel before the Lord. You're going to pray afterward then? Okay. Pa- after we're done, I'm, I'm praying, Pastor's going to offer up a special prayer. Father in heaven, it is with gratitude that we bow before you this morning, that you give us life, health, wealth. All that we have, Lord, is yours, and you have given it to us to use. And thank you for being willing to share especially you shared Jesus with us so that our sins could be forgiven and that we might have life eternal with him someday soon. We thank you for safety for the traveling of the Pathfinders as he went to Mohaven this past day. We thank you for praises that Pam has for her mom and for a new manager at the store that where she works. We thank you for the hearts to hands ministry that we are able to partake in and lord we ask that you give us a good planning session for the one in uh, july and also to be with the planning session that's going to take place on the this coming tuesday Um, we ask for those who are ill lord like the lady that anita takes care of her name is elsa lord she's doesn't want anything to happen to her, but it's according to your will what goes on in her life. That you'll help Anita to be a blessing to her, and that helps as a blessing to Anita. And we also especially hold up Pastor Father. He's having issues with his vision again, and has almost like a surgery coming up on Wednesday where they're going to do some injections into his eyes. And I know it's not a pleasant thing to have your eyes bothered, because even touching your eyes is something else. So I pray for strength for him, and I pray that you will guide the doctor's hands so that they can see what's going on and that the appointments will turn out well, Lord, so that his vision will be restored somewhat to him. Um, There are many of us that raised their hands, Lord, that we have unspoken requests, and you know what they are. They're between you and me, uh, you and us, and we ask according to your will that you will honor them. We thank you for hearing our prayer, Lord. We thank you for your watch care over us. And we most of all thank you for Jesus, who has sent the Holy Spirit, that we might have our minds open. Bless Pastor as he brings the message to us today. We ask these special blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. It's okay, let her do it. Okay, play it. Go ahead. Okay, Pastor's going to offer a prayer too. I just want to add this as a separate and special prayer, and then we'll all sing together here our prayer, O Lord. As you know, in the district, we are involved in a project called Drugs Close to Home. And it is our participation to reach out to families. So our approach is different from, there are several projects out there, but it is different in that we're reaching out to the families affected and not so much about the user or the abuser. So um, we have gotten the word out to the media. May is a heavy month for this project, the 13th and the 18th and the 20th. There will be flyers so you can see the locations. And we just want you to also remember this and pray for, uh, uh, as Elder Antonio Conway from Willoughby leads the, the district in this with their support of the elders, and we're hoping that as you see the locations and appointments, that you will attend as well to uh, swell the attendance. And so uh, that's what I want to pray about. Now, Lord, we continue to call upon your name in a special way. We are here to serve our community in as many ways as we possibly can, and yet we cannot do them all. This project, Drugs Close to Home, 
is being supported by the district, but we're more concerned with the people we can reach out to, the families affected in what the nation has now looked upon the Northeast Ohio as an epidemic, a heroin epidemic. Certainly, we need you to go ahead of us to these families and including the users and abusers, but our approach is family concentration and explaining to them uh, how it does affect a person and why the person reacts the way they do and to help families support their loved ones who are involved or affected or impacted by this. So we call upon you to help us in our, our small way and in our attempt to serve this community in uh, this, this project, which is extremely important, but also affects so many people in Northeast Ohio. We put that before you, Lord, and we thank you ahead of time for what you will do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Incline thine ear to us and grant us thy peace. Amen. Amen. To continue our scripture reading, the next one will be from the same chapter of Matthew 25 in the first two verses. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five of them were foolish. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word. smaller that you will not mind that I do things from down here it puts me a little closer to you and uh, good to see all of you um, 
Joshua's still with us, so that's a good thing. Good to see you, Joshua. June 3rd, it would appear to me, is going to be a busy Sabbath. Um, there is uh, the one-day camp meeting down at uh, Mount Vernon. And um, so some of you may be going to that, so uh, that's fine. Uh, also on June 3rd here, we will be having a baptism. Uh, Carla's three children, Stevie, Mary, and Nico, will be baptized on that day here. Um, they wanted their membership to be at Chesterland, so we will hold the baptism here, and then soon after that, the girls will be uh, going off to school. So uh, uh, if you're here and be able to take part in that, that's great. We, we live in a very busy world. And so as part of that world, we too are busy. We, when I say I mean Christians, we are very busy and it's not all in the work of the Lord. We have lives to live places to go, people to see, things to do. For so many of us, that requires schedules. To keep up with those schedules, many of us have calendars posted at work and at home, alerts and notifications on our phones, Whatever method we can use to keep those appointments. But the toughest schedule ever heard of is still out there. It is important. Probably the most important appointment any of us have ever attempted to make. If we miss this appointment, we'll never have to make another appointment. Now here's what's difficult about keeping this appointment. We don't know the day. We don't know the date. <laughs> and we don't know the hour. And the Bible says they all slumbered and slept. Let's bow our heads. Now, Lord, be with us here as we look into your word and uh, bless the message, bless the hearers. And thank you so much for being with us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to try to... Adjust this upward, and uh, that was not very successful. <laughs> ah, okay, so I'll deal with it like this. <laughs> Our message today is they all slum. Ah, Joshua's coming with the strong hands, of which I do not have. Is that as high as it will go? Maybe that was the problem. Yeah, that's as high as it will go. Well, thank you so much, Joshua. Appreciate that. Wow. They all slumbered and slept. Believers trust the Bible's account of the second coming. We are not only trust it, but we are counting on it. We don't know when. And, and I believe God has designated that as our reality. I believe that God, knowing us so well, knows that Christians like me, I'll just pick on me, will, will pretty much walk on the edge of life while planning to go straight, walk the line, do what Jesus wants us to do, right on up to the last minute. 
in order to be saved. And so I say, I'll just pick on myself on that. Pushing it too far instead of preparing and getting it together. It's not because I don't care, nor is it that I don't believe. It's simply the sin in me compels me to procrastinate almost to my own ruin. Matthew 26, 38 to 40. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Verse 40, and he cometh unto his disciples, and he cometh unto his disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? The scene is the Garden of Gethsemane. It is just hours before Jesus is arrested and begins his final journey toward the cross. We, we know that part of this story. It is that hour that Jesus mentions that catches my attention. Even in this critical time of literally his last hours on earth, attended by his trusted disciples, those who claim to be his most loyal followers, even in the presence of Jesus, they could not wait an hour for the Savior to return. In the parable of the talents, we know the part where the third servant hid his one talent rather than invest it in the work of the master. So there would be an increase to that investment, which means the reluctant servant wasted his time. He hid from the opportunities to increase the bounty of souls to the kingdom. And instead said, Lord, I, I just thought it was better to concern myself with the souls already attending church. Make sure they're happy doing things that will keep them coming. Certainly we want to look after our own. Certainly we do. You can't discount that. But there is a group out there a large group that has still not heard of Jesus and do not understand the significance of Jesus in that he died for us, loves us, and because of that, him being our creator, is coming back. There's a whole bunch of people that, that aren't buying into that. These instances represent slumber. And, and the people the Bible describes in these instances, they're not criminal. They're not society's low life. These are the good guys. Maybe a little misguided in their thinking or approach to Christianity, but their intentions are good. Regardless of that, they all slumbered and slept. Today we take a look at the parable of the ten versions. We've been looking at Jesus' parables and trying to get lessons from them all this first half of the year. Today is the ten version. It is a parable about the end times the last days on earth, and the condition of Christians before Jesus returns. The parable is about the second coming of Jesus to collect the redeemed who may or may not be ready. They all slumbered and slept. I want to concentrate on that phrase because it describes the ten versions, the whole lot of them, 
Not simply the five wise or the five foolish. Not separating them. It's the whole bunch. But on that day and hour, but of that day and hour, no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus here speaks of the second coming in terms of preparedness. No one really knows but him and the Father when he is returning. During this same dissertation, Jesus compares his second coming to the flood in Noah's time. The, the people knew the flood was coming. The people heard the prediction for 120 years. They, didn't, they just didn't know when the appointment with death or salvation was. Consequently, they lived their lives as if nothing was going to happen. We're used to appointments. We make appointments as part of our daily living. Our appointments have days, dates, and times. That's what we're used to. That's what we like. And even with that, we fudge and are lax with some of our appointments. In other words, we do consider some appointments more important than others. There, there are those who feel to be late is fashionable. Others feel no responsibility to be constrained by time and appointments. You can set that appointment, but that's okay for you. But they are not constrained by that. The world must adjust to their lack of schedule. But there is an appointment that has already been set. It was set by Jesus himself. It is the most important appointment of our lives, but we, we don't get to know when. Only the Godhead knows the exact day, date, and time. And we know, all we know is that it's coming. And we don't want to miss it. We don't want to be late. They all slumbered and slept. Christ Object Lessons, page four, pages 405 and 406. Lingering near the bride's house are ten young women robed in white. Each carries a lighted lamp and a small flagon of oil. Uh, all are anxiously watching for the appearance of the bridegroom. All are. But there is a delay. Hour after hour passes. The watchers become weary and fall asleep. Jesus tells this story to his disciples. Uh, possibly a true story. Uh, th there are those who feel Jesus actually had seen that happen at a wedding. But it explains a couple of groups represented in the last days. Jesus keeps matters simple. Two groups in the end times, spiritually speaking. Those ready, those not ready. That's in its simplest terms. However, know this. Both groups think, both groups think, both groups think they are ready. think they're ready for the bridegroom to come. Ellen White writes that there was a delay, and that delay turned into several hours. I don't know how many of you have ever experienced that by attending a wedding, and it's delayed for several hours. I attended one where they almost canceled the wedding. They were so late. This was not half hour late. This was not an hour late. This was not three hours late. It was close to five hours late. Some people left and just didn't even care whether there was going to be a wedding. Since it was out of town and I was attending, I didn't have much choice to uh, but stay there and wait with everyone else. Bridesmaids took a change back into regular clothes to save the dresses because it was hot, and they, and they were beginning to sweat in those dresses, and they took them off. 
had to put them back on. You want me to tell you which one was late, right? The, the groom or the bride? It was the groom. It, it was the groom. He's, poor dude, he just, at the last minute, he was struggling. Wasn't sure this was what he wanted to do. You know, that's fine. Just let somebody know. That's all you got to do. In the parable, the bridesmaids become weary with delay and fell asleep. The expression, the Lord delayeth his coming, is found in another parable where Jesus talks of a pretty woman, I'm sorry, of a pretty mean manservant, a pretty mean manservant, left in charge of others and treats them badly, seemingly for no other reason that he got bored with the fact that the master who had left him in charge was hadn't come back yet, and he was bored with what to do, and just out of pure meanness, he treated them badly, misusing his official position. That's an extreme example of what can happen when we get bored and tired with our mission and our purpose. The bridesmaids were simply tired. The simple joy of hearing about the wedding and accepting this invitation had lost its luster. The, the glow associated with shopping and preparing for the wedding had begun to dim. The pure excitement of anticipation of the day they would enter the wedding feast was now being swapped for just a place to rest. They were tired of preparing. Mm. They were tired of preparing for the bridegroom, for the wedding to start. Tired of sharing stories of other similar great events. They just wanted it to happen. And, and, and if it was delayed, well, too bad. Each generation in this life, preparing, hoping, and waiting for the return of Jesus can claim they've been waiting a long time. Sometimes that is true, sometimes that is not. One thing that is very clear, if we've been follow, uh, uh, follow, trying to follow Jesus through church and coming to church, and we've been in this for 35 years, one thing that is very clear, we've been coming to church for 35 years. It will be up to you and the Lord to decide whether you have actually been preparing for him to come back for 35 years. There's a big difference. A real, real big difference. Some have passed on and are sleeping till the trumpet sounds. I just had another cousin pass away this past week. And uh, our family reunion's coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm almost, I don't know, almost scared to go simply because our family's a pretty close family. We're large, but we're close. And the emotion involved, I'm not even sure if I'm prepared for because in this first six months, we've had two deaths in the family. But thanks be to God, <laughs> their concerns of this earth are over. And so, dying in Jesus, we look forward to that time. First Thessalonians describes that group as coming up out of the ground first, so they will know their hope was not in vain. There's another group of virgins not so Fortunate. See, the groups represent a set of Christians who all believe, 
but one group has fooled itself into adopting distractions, ways to spend time doing whatever till the bridegroom shows up. They're called virgins, Ellen White says, because they, they all believe in a pure truth. To me, that is the truth that is found in the Bible, God's word. They're, they're, carrying, that, they're, they're, they're carrying that faith in lamps represented by the word of God. And the oil represents the Holy Spirit. You, we, we, can't, we can't run out of the Bible, but we can lose our supply of the Holy Spirit simply by letting our lamps burn out with no plan to resupply. God's word is constant. It will not change. It is always there. But, but we are, will only use it as we are moved by the Holy Spirit to do so. The Holy Spirit operates a little different. Yes, the Holy Spirit is constant and consistent in those who will use it. And even after a while, though the Bible is constant and never changing, without you including the Holy Spirit in your life towards service and towards study and toward prayer and dedication, you, that, your knowledge of the Bible may stay, but what is it, good is it doing if you're not using it? Because you will only use it as moved by the Holy Spirit. And if we don't use the Holy Spirit, we will run out of that supply. Know our Bibles like backwards and forwards like the back of our hand, and it's stagnant because there is no supply of the Holy Spirit urging us to use what we know. So the, we find the ten maidens suddenly awakened by the call that the bridegroom has arrived. All is ready to enter the wedding, the wedding hall. In a rush to regroup, out of a sudden sleep, lamps having lost their trim, uh, five of them, fine. They have no additional supply. Some of these lamps really didn't hold all that much. They go from about that size. I have seen replicas to maybe about that large with a well in it to hold the oil. The, the ones who ran out because they had no additional supply, they asked of the other five who are equipped with additional oil to share. And that five says no. <laughs> they express they only have enough oil for themselves. Just pause here for a moment and let's look at that. Should that be the attitude of the Christian? <laughs> Uh, and before you answer that too quickly, keep in mind that the Bible does describe the ten virgins as five wise and five foolish. Apparently, if you run out of oil, you're one of the foolish. How many times have you heard me say salvation is not group therapy? It's individual. Salvation is based on the individual relationship with Jesus. Whatever relationship my mother had with Jesus doesn't count for me. I have to have my own. She can't share her relationship. She shared with me her knowledge of the word of God. She can't even share the Holy Spirit. Those things are not shareable. The things that have to do with my relationship with God are not shareable. 
The Holy Spirit keeps resupplying enough for me to keep that relationship going with God. It is the word of God that I share. And, and I can imbue that by telling stories of my personal life, and, you know, sharing how, God, how I met God and how God, what God has done for me. All those things can be done. But that person through relationship must develop their own oil, their own supply of oil. So let's not look at the five wise virgins, virgins too harshly. Possibly in the sharing. And as long as we stay in preparation mode, which is what we will need to do, we could not use up our supply of oil, our supply of the Holy Spirit. God keeps supplying and resupplying, guaranteed. Possibly, you might think I'm only referring to the physical work of the gospel when I said that it is constant and consistent. Not really. Even the best, even the best of Christians get tired. And the Lord knows it. See, this is not condemning those who get tired and lay down and take a rest. They all slumbered and slept. I'm referring to an attitude that keeps us prepared so that even if caught at rest, that is, even sleep, we have made the necessary preparations to awaken to the call when it comes. Christ Object Lessons, page 412. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and the sleeping virgins were, were roused from their slumbers, it was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency, and the other was found without preparation. Being tired in this work, we're believers, that's going to happen. Many of you in this audience have truly been active. That alone can make you tired. I haven't been as active in the work or my relationship with the Lord as some of you. And I'm already tired and wish you would have come yesterday. Getting tired is okay. The question is, was I prepared for him to come yesterday? That's something different. Something totally different. They all slumbered and slept. So just how do we remain prepared <laughs> even as we take a break? even as we rest, even as we sleep. You do realize there will be those who are physically sleep when Jesus actually arrives the second time. I realize that may be difficult to imagine if this world is in the chaos that is predicted Christians will undoubtedly be tired of such chaos and the conditions of the world associated with such chaos. Falling asleep will not rob you of joining Jesus, whether that be the grave or you're just tired and taking a break. And by the way, all the doing, I don't want you to get me wrong on this one, or take me wrong on this, all of the doing we associate with the work of the gospel will not ensure your ticket to heaven. The attitude of preparedness will influence what we do. We talked a little bit about that in the Sabbath school class this morning. See, there are so many of us, and I'm talking about Christians and non-Christians, we are capable by the simple power of choice that God gave us to do good things. 
So it's not all about things. I mean, just keep up with your news. There are bad people that do good things. I mean, the one in history that just pops in my mind is Al Capone, the gangster. The only reason today that you know when your milk will expire is because of Al Capone. Some of his group in Little Sicily, where he had to leave Chicago for a while, and, and, and the people were constantly getting sick off of expired milk. Because back then, they didn't put dates on it. He or got that organized to require some kind of date when the milk would expire so little children wouldn't be getting sick. Past that, I'm not sure what else he did for humanity except kill a lot of them. So, so we are capable by our simple power of choice as sinners to do good things. Good things is not what will get us to heaven. It is the attitude in which we did them that is connected with our relationship with God. Constantly reading God's word in a manner that requires God to join us and resupply us and imbue what we read through the Holy Spirit. Keeping that oil supply always constant and there. So Jesus calls it relationship. It's the, prepare, it's the preparation we ensure through relationship with Jesus. Matthew 7, 23, depart from me, I never you, knew you, is Jesus saying, get out of my sight because we didn't have a relationship. And if you read that section, you know they talk about, well, Lord, no, we visited the sick, we did this, we did that, all deeds they start claiming. Good things, good things. And Jesus still says, depart from me, we didn't have a relationship. It's his wake up to reality to those who spent more time seeking salvation through the doing rather than relationship with the Savior who bid them to do. Relationship with Jesus and lifting Jesus up gives us the consistent flow of oil we need for our mission. That's the difference between the wise and the foolish. Christianity must become a lifestyle rather than a title that you wear during the day and take it off at night and lay it on the mantle somewhere and pick it up for the next day. Or that you lay it aside Anytime you want to do something you should not be doing, and then pick it up back afterwards. They all slumbered and slept, but it was not the slumber at all that cost the five foolish virgins their salvation. So then, this sermon really becomes, for us today, no more than a reminder. It is certainly not in any way accusatory. I don't have the right to do that, and I don't have the right to judge anyone in here, working too hard on my own relationship with God to get to heaven. And for those of you who have heard me over and over, you realize that my sermons are always for myself and I come before you and talk out loud about what I've been talking to with the Lord about my own life. So if there's something in it you can apply to yourself, great. Yes, pastor needs to remind himself from time to time. Just what are you doing? 
Where are you headed? Where are you trying to go? Are you still on track with Jesus? Because in the final analysis, all that you're trying to do, things, is not going to cut it. They're nice. It can help keep a church involved if it wants to be involved. But it's not going to save you or the church. <laughs> wow. Wow. It's still going to come down to the relationship you personally have. And so most of my sermons are about relationship, to remind us that as we move forward with the Lord, keep that relationship with God. Will your relationship with God influence and better everything you're going to do? Oh, yeah, I personally believe that. Yes, yeah, yes, I do. but work on the relationship with God and not so much on what you're trying to do. God will take care of what you're trying to do. Let's pray. Now, Lord, thank you for everything that you do for us. I am so grateful with how you continue to stand by your sacrifice. You not only died for us, but you work with us. You desire a relationship. We certainly need that relationship. Again, thank you. Bless everyone here and their families. And we put that in your hands and thank you ahead of time for what you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I believe that I am supposed to lead us in our closing song. 518, can we all stand together? Standing on the promises of Christ my King through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing. I am standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God. Bound to Him eternal by His life's comfort. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm 
I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Lord, continue to be with us. Thank you so much for this day and everyone who is here. Save us in your kingdom when you come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.